Hi, I'm James Gardner, host of Your History, Your Story, a podcast for everybody who loves stories about interesting people and events told by those who uncovered them from within their own family trees. This, we hope, will inspire you to discover and celebrate your history and your story. On March 11, 2005, 22-year-old Kevin Berthia stood on a narrow pipe on the outside railing of San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge, 220 feet above the cold water of the bay. Kevin, who had struggled most of his life with a major depression disorder, woke up feeling hopeless that morning and could only think about stopping the pain he was feeling. A recent job loss and mounting bills had pushed him to his limit. As Kevin was preparing to carry out his plan, he suddenly heard a voice call out to him. That voice belonged to California Highway Patrolman Kevin Briggs. Over the next 92 minutes, Officer Briggs provided a caring, listening ear and offered words of hope to Kevin Berthia. At first, Kevin felt anger toward the voice on the other side of the railing because it was interrupting his plan to get out of pain. However, things began to change the longer Kevin spoke and Officer Briggs listened. Kevin eventually felt enough hope to climb back over the railing to safety. In this episode of Your History, Your Story, we will be speaking with both Kevin Berthia and Kevin Briggs, who retired from the California Highway Patrol in 2013 after 20 years of service. The two men will recount the events of that day in 2005 and their subsequent reunion in 2013. Today, these two men, who have become close friends, our mental health and suicide prevention advocates and speakers who work tirelessly both individually and together to help bring hope to others and save lives. I'd now like to welcome Kevin Berthia and Kevin Briggs to our show. Welcome, guys. Well, thank you, James. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, it's a million stories out there, so I appreciate the opportunity to be able to tell mine. Hi, James. Pleasure to be here with you. Well, we are honored to have you as guests. Kevin Berthia, can you please share what was going on in your life just prior to March 11th, 2005, the day that you and then Officer Briggs first met on the Golden Gate Bridge? Uh, At the time, I was 22 years old, um, just lost my job recently, um, just become a new father all this new debt that came, um, new responsibilities that came. Uh, and I hadn't yet dealt with the responsibilities that I already had. So I was just overwhelmed. Um, I got to a place where it was just, I couldn't, you know, bear the idea of trying to get through the days anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And Kevin Briggs, can you share with us what was going on in your life during that same time period, just before meeting Kevin on the bridge? Certainly. I was with the California Highway Patrol, had been with them for a number of years then, and uh, I was on motorcycle patrol that day, working down uh, in the area of the bridge and and adjoining areas. So it was just a a routine work day for me, and uh, I was out of the Marin County area of the California Highway Patrol, which connects to that Golden Gate Bridge to San Francisco. So it was just another routine day. Do you happen to remember what kind of weather it was that day? You know, if I remember right, uh, I I think it was clear out, but cool. And especially down at that bridge, um, it's it's almost always cold down there. And then uh, we we get a lot of wind too. So I would say clear, cool, but, but we'd have some wind. Yeah, it always, it always seems to be windy there. Anytime I've ever seen any films of that area, it's not not a really, uh, you think of San Francisco, you think of California, oh, it may be warm, but it, it gets pretty cold there, right? Yes, the microclimates, that bridge is different. I tell folks, I don't care whether it's December or July, whenever you're going, if you're coming to visit, always bring a jacket. Oh, definitely. Now, Kevin Berthia, you you said that you were going through a really tough time just prior to that day in March of 2005. Can you, I know this may be difficult, can you recount for us really the events of that morning and what brought you to the bridge that day? 
Uh, that morning I got up. Um, it was about, you know, 4.38, 4.39 a.m. And I just, I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't bear it. The, the, the idea of, of getting up in the morning knowing my life was going to be like this. So, you know, I stayed up, um, got up. I actually got out the bed about, about eight, eight fifteen, something around that time. And, uh, I don't know. I just told myself I had to get myself out of pain. I didn't know how, I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, you know, the bridge was so far out of my brain because I never, I never, I never even knew the Golden Gate Bridge existed. <laughs> I'm from Oakland, California. I mean, I knew the Bay Bridge existed, but I didn't, you know, this is before Google. This is before YouTube. This is before information is so readily now and exposed right now. We can, you know, you can find out about anything now, but this is 2005, you know, this information is not there. If you don't know about something, you just don't know about it. And that's just what it was. So the bridge came about on that morning. As I'm pumping my gas, I thought about the Golden Gate Bridge. It was just, you know, I didn't even know how to get there. I didn't know how, you know, I didn't know, you know, I knew I, I, I had to ask for directions to get there because I didn't even know this place existed. I just knew I had to jump off this bridge. So it wasn't like I had thoughts of it months before that, you know, looked it up. Like, you know, I heard a lot of stories of people that do that. I mean, I have, haven't heard one story of on the actual morning of, and I don't even know this place is famous for suicide attempts, you know, are iconic for suicide attempts. And it's just, it was just one of those things. So when you got to the bridge, what actually happened when you got there? When I got to the bridge, I finally got there um, and I parked my car and I left my keys in the ignition and I grabbed my prepaid phone. And then once I got out there, I was kind of looking for one reason, you know, not to jump, you know, but I, I've got, I've gotten here now. And I just, I couldn't get out this dark place that I was in and I couldn't feel, you know, anything but but that dark place. And so I, I think I made one phone call and which which kind of didn't go through or the person didn't answer the phone. And I remember looking over the railing and looking over to the water and knowing it was nothing good, nothing going to stop me. And it was just, I saw peace and, you know, not having to be a burden when I in that water. I mean, I saw, you know, not having to wake up being worthless anymore. And so I knew I just, I had to do it now that I was here. I mean, I, I wasn't here to talk anymore. Mm. So in the picture that I've seen of you standing on the side of the bridge, you had actually climbed over a little railing and you were standing on like a pipe or something. Uh, when officer Briggs approached, I didn't even know he was, you know, my, my brain was such in a dark place. I had already made that the, I had already accepted in my heart that I was jumping in and I was going to jump off the bridge. So as I'm, as I'm literally in the air, you know, he he yelled something and I don't even, I don't even know what he said, but it, it kind of snapped me out of this, that dark place that I was in momentarily. And I grabbed the railing and turned myself around on that cord. So that's how I got, um, I didn't, I actually jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, you know, I, I'm really realizing I didn't, I didn't climb, I didn't get there and just kind of, I actually jumped. And, you know, if it wasn't, hadn't been for that distraction, you know, I don't, I know I wouldn't be here because I was, I was, I'm a pretty athletic guy. So I know that I was, you know, aiming to get over that railing, which I did and um, get into that water. But, you know, luckily enough, I was distracted. I turned myself around on a four inch cord and, you know, a conversation began to happen. Wow. Wow. Ke uh, Kevin Briggs, describe how were you first alerted to the possibility of Kevin hurting himself and, and how did you first approach him? I was advised by my dispatch of a man on the sidewalk saying that he's going to jump and he's actually on the cell phone talking to someone. So uh, I responded down that way and I'm on my motorcycle, which gives me the opportunity to go down the sidewalk. So I started at the north end going south. And as I neared the north towers, when I saw the description of him still on the cell phone, so I say, hey, this, this has to be the guy. So then I stopped, I don't, I don't know, 50 feet away or something like that. And as I was getting off of my motorcycle is when I see him look my direction and then go over and, and jump that rail. And as he did so, I yelled something. Kev doesn't remember. I don't remember, but I yelled something, blah, blah, something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he reached out, caught that rail, slammed into it, and wound up on that little pipe, which goes around the north tower there and you know after that pipe what you don't see is there's nothing so it's 220 feet down after that but i couldn't see him from where i was at so i thought he had left and, and was gone until i 
walked up there and saw his t-shirt through the slots in the rail, in the pedestrian rail. So then I stepped back and went into my mode of how I typically approach and talk to folks. Wow. So you actually thought he was, he had already done it. He already jumped. Oh boy. Kevin Berthia, how did you feel when you were first approached by Officer Briggs? I was, I was infuriated, <laughs> um, to say the least. Uh, it, it was, yeah, I was, I don't, I, I can't remember too many times in my life where I was that, where I've been that mad. And because I, you know, the plan was to get out of pain. Like, you know, the plan was not, and I wasn't here for attention. I've never, I'm not an attention guy. I hate it. I hate, atten- like, you know, that's not, I didn't come here to have everybody look at me and feel sorry for, no, I came here because I was tired. You know, I was tired of living this life. So, and, and for me, the voice that distracted me stopped me. You know, it was just like, who, you know, who are you? Like, you know, I, cause I never, I'm in this dark place. I never looked up. I never knew he was a cop. I never knew anything about this. I just went off a voice, you know, I thought it was a human that just, you know, and it's just like, it stopped me from completing my goal. You know, you gotta, you know, gotta realize the bridge is, was like my 11th, I believe my 10th or 11th uh, suicide attempt. So for me, I was just, this was supposed to be my, you know, this is not number one, you know, this is, I've, I've failed, you know, at doing this before. So I'm looking at this, as this being my final, like, this has to work, like jumping off a bridge, like it can't get no, you know, this, this is the foolproof plan. And so to be stopped, I was very, very angry to say the least. And you didn't even know who to be angry at. You couldn't even see him. I was yelling. I was yelling. And I knew that I could hear his voice. And I was telling him, stay back. If you get any closer, that's it. Because I, it was nothing that was holding me. I wasn't even holding myself up. Um, you know, I was, the, the, it was, the wind was kind of supporting my back and kind of pushing me up against the railing. You know, I, it was, you know, I wasn't holding on. I had both of my arms in, in my t-shirt. I'm freezing cold because I didn't expect to be standing on a railing. You know, so oh, no. I'm afraid of height. So now I'm except I'm I'm mad at myself, you know, and then he's trying to talk to me. So that's just how the conversation played out for the first, I want to say the first 10 minutes. I mean, it literally was a whole bunch of yelling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, Kevin Briggs. So what training and instincts did you employ when speaking with Kevin? You know, tell us a little bit about that. Training was very, very little. Um, I had, I had none when I first started working on the bridge. So it was, I'm not going to say trial by air, but it was trial by let's see what works and, and hopefully we can help some people. Um, it was some time before I went through crisis intervention team training, CIT, and then way towards the latter part of, of my career with the higher patrol, I was lucky enough to go to the FBI crisis negotiator school. But with Kev, um, I just deployed what I had thought would be good for myself, walking up, how would I feel if I was over there? Who or, you know, what I want coming up to me and and what would I want them to say? So uh, I just raised my right hand and said, hi, I'm Kevin. Is it okay if I come up and chat with you for a while? And like Kev says, he wanted nothing to do with me. He was screaming at me, Mm -hmm. just, you know, pretty much leave me the hell alone. And he wanted to just sit there for a while and contemplate things and then probably go. So I stayed back, didn't approach him, and just kept asking him, hey, I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to reach out and grab you. I just want to come up and chat with you. So it took some time before he allowed me to do that. And then when I got up there, I, I just wanted to find out what was going on, what had transpired to go to this level today where he is at. And I really just wanted to listen. So I had no intentions of reaching out and grabbing him, trying to pull him back in. Um, I want folks to come back on their own because it takes so much courage to go over that rail to begin with. It must take, you know, even greater courage to come back over and face everything again. But if I can get the opportunity to speak with them and chat with them and listen, then that's what I was going to do. So you needed time. You needed time to speak with him. Absolutely. And to listen. Yes. Wow. So speaking of time, so Kevin Berthia, you and Officer Briggs spoke for 92 minutes, I read, on the bridge. Mm -hmm. At what point did you start to feel that 
you might consider abandoning the plan you had. After I was done talking mm. and not a moment before. I mean, it was, I want people to always realize that this was my very first conversation I've ever had in my life. Wow. Like I, I've never, I've never opened up and talked to anyone in my life. This was, this was my very, you know, at 19 when I had, you know, my first, well, one of my first psychiatric evaluation and, and they tried to put me in therapy, you know, I shut down. I never, I never opened up. This was my first time in my life opening up like ever. So I needed to get out things that, that were crushing me. Um, I needed to let them out and let them, you know, into the world so that I could heal from them. And that opportunity was given to me and I've never been given that opportunity. So after I was able to talk about those things and after he made me realize um, my daughter, you know, whose birthday was is April 6th. I went to the bridge March 11th. Her first birthday is April 6th. I would have missed her first birthday. Um, if he would have talked about the adoption and kind of cornered that, I would have probably not been here. If he would have talked about the divorce, um, I probably wouldn't have been here if he would have talked about all these different me feeling work. I mean, it was, it was her, it was, it was her. It was making me realize that I needed to be here for her. And that's what gave me um, the hope um, that on that particular day, it was not, it, it wasn't going to be anything else but her. Um, and he made me see that I needed to be here for her. And I was able to be at her first birthday because of, um, because of that conversation. Oh my goodness. Thank the Lord for that. So it was a combination really of officer Briggs listening to you, but also helping you to think about your daughter and being there for her and giving you hope through that. So it was a combination of listening and sort of having you realize what you had to look forward to. Absolutely. Mm, yeah. So Kevin Briggs, at what point, did you start to feel that perhaps you were connecting with Kevin? When he started breaking down a little bit, I kept focusing on his daughter after some time. We have to come up with what we call a, a hook. What can we hook into folks and talk about? You know, and what do we steer clear of? What do they do not like to talk about? So, of course, his daughter uh, was a big deal in his life. So I started talking about, tell me more about her and, and what colors does she like? And just little things that would dig into him more. Uh, and that's what I really began to focus on. So it's about building that rapport, allowing them to vent and taking that time so he will trust me and kind of I'll make a decision and see if, if he buys into it but buys into it with in, in reality, you know, that he wants to live and come back and fight to live. And that's what I'm looking for. Tell me a little bit about when Kevin climbed over the railing, how, what was going on inside you when that was happening? So after this hour and a half or so, um, I told him, and I do this with a, a lot of folks, Hey, I want to take a break. We've been here for a while now. I want to give you some time to process things. And I said, I'm only going to take a step back, though, if you promise me not to do anything until I come back up here. So he said yes. So I stepped back, um, you know, 10 feet or so, give him a break. And I want him to think about everything. I gave him just a, a couple of minutes. Then I asked his permission. Hey, Kev, is it OK if I come back up? And when I went up, I said, what do you think about everything that's going on today? You got your daughter's birthday coming up. You know, a number of things uh, are happening. So I said, man, you can always come back. I'm happy to chat with you, hopefully on this side of the rail. But today, let's get you back over here and get you some help. And he thought about it a little bit, and he said, I want to come back over. So that picture that folks see is about that time when he's going to come back over. Uh, he came back over, and, and I asked him. You know, what was it that was that final decision for you to come back over? I want to learn still. And he said, you know what? You let me speak and you listened. You didn't sit here and try to fix everything. So that was the, the biggest thing is being there for someone and listening without trying to fix it. Well, we can all learn from that, huh? That's uh, when we go through struggles or 
somebody's hurting and we want to fix their pain right away. We want to fix the situation. And sometimes we just have to listen, just listen. Exactly. Yes. Uh, uh, Kevin Berthia, that moment you climbing over the railing and what was going on inside of you? Uh, a million things. I mean, I was, part of me was happy, but part of me was sad, um, you know, to be honest, because I knew that everything that brought me to the bridge, I still, it was still there, um, you know, um, and I, now that I, and I had to face this day now, uh, I didn't know the, how big of a, you know, day it was going to be because, you know, like I say, I don't, I didn't realize, you know, it was a, a, going to be a photo of me. I didn't realize any of those things. I thought it was just going to be, you know, something I can keep to myself that nobody else will really have to know about. And, you know, I mean, I'll never have to see any of these people on this bridge again. So it's not a big deal. I didn't know, you know, like I say, I didn't know that photo was taken. And that that was the game changer for me um, because it, it was hard for me to accept that, that that I drove myself to the bridge, like because I spent my whole life time making it look like he had it together. And, you know, now that there's a photo out there and people can see, you know, see my secret, you know, that I've been hiding from the world. I, I was ashamed of, you know, I didn't know who I was going to go back to. I didn't know who I was going to become. So I had to create a new person, you know, which fit what felt like over the next couple of years, I was creating new people, you know, just so I, cause I didn't know who to go back to. I didn't know, I've always tried to not be Kevin, you know, cause Kevin has always been sad or Kevin has always been, you know, so I spent my whole life not trying to be me. And in that I've tried to be other things and, you know, it got me so far away from who Kevin really is. <laughs> um, and that's, that was the reality. Um, um, and that's the, you know, the truth for to be told after, after coming back, it just, I knew that, you know, I had my daughter's birthday coming up, which was great, but you know, I got, after I got, after my daughter's birthday, it was just depression hit me. Like it never hit me before because I had to, I didn't know who I was going to go back to. Did, uh, did you feel that at some point things started to get better? Like being introduced to the, the new Kevin, did you start to feel things were changing for the better? No. After the bridge, I went, I completely, you know, went into the, one of the darkest places in my life. Uh, it was tough and it got tougher. Um, year by year, it was something new, um, you know. Um, I've changed and moved and, and after the bridge, moved cities, uh, which was hard, was tough environmental change for me. Um, a couple of years later, my grandfather died, which was tough. Um, I did. I never kind of rebounded from that because that was my that was my rock. There was only two people in the world. I always said I needed it, my grandfather and my mom. And, you know, to lose my Mount Rushmore of people, you know, to lose one of those people, it was just devastating for me. So, you know, it just it put me in a more of a depressive state. You know, things just got tough. Um, child custody battle in 08, 09, um, my own divorce. I mean, things never got better um, until, you know, I was able until 2013. Um, literally um, that meeting reuniting with officer briggs is what changed my life again ironically it was it was literally may 11 i mean may, march 11 2005 that changed my life and but it spiraled me all out of control and it wasn't i didn't i didn't get um any kind of clarity of anything until you know may 7th of 2013 like so all those years in between which was eight years you know i i, I was all over the place you know, another 10 attempts. So I was up to 22 failed suicide attempts by 2013. Oh boy. So now tell me what brought the two of you together in 2013. Sergeant Briggs, he, he wrote a letter to my mom. I mean, my mom wrote him a letter and, and saying, thank you for being Kevin's guardian. Um, and, you know, cause my mom, you know, she's since that day, she's been, you know, psychologically it's been hard for her. Cause you know, you know, I'm her baby and that's just what it was. So she wrote him a letter and he held on to that letter and he was going to be honored by the America's foundation for suicide prevention. They put on a lifesavers award to gala every year and they wanted to honor Sergeant Briggs and they reached out to my mom. I haven't, I, I've never talked about this day. Um, I've, I've seen the picture probably two times, the photo of the newspaper, the one time that my mom showed me when I got home from the hospital. And the next time I was, it was used against me in the child custody hearing, mm. you know, and it blindsided me. So that was the only two times that I saw the photo. I didn't talk about that day. I didn't talk, I didn't go to outpatient literally, um, you know, my, the AFSP reached out to my mom, my mom, you know, kind of, you know, she wasn't going to go. So she kind of convinced me. She didn't really tell me why I was going to New York, but it's like, it was like, 
you know, I want some tickets or whatever. She told me whatever. She know I don't ask any questions. That's just who I am. I don't ask any, I don't, I don't ask questions. I just do it. Like whatever needs to be done, I just do it. And she just was banking on me being who I am. And that's what it was. She got me. I ended up going to New York. I really didn't know why I was going until I got there. I didn't, I didn't know until I was literally off the plane and in the hotel room that I was going to be reunited with the man from the photo. Cause I didn't know nothing about this man. I didn't know he was a cop. I didn't know, you know, he was white. I didn't know nothing about Briggs, nothing. I knew nothing about, I didn't know his name cause I didn't care, but that day was so far away, far from me that I never, I never did any research into it. Like, so, it, you know, learning about all this, I didn't find out until literally when I got to New York at that Lifesavers Gala. And what, what happened right after that, uh, Kevin, what did you, how did that feel? How did things start to change from that point on? Literally, I got on stage um, and the photo of myself um, went on, went up there on the Jumbotron. And I remember I turned around. It was the first time that I accepted that it was me in the photo. And that was a powerful moment for me because I accepted that I, that it was me in the photo, but it, I, but I didn't accept that it was going to define me. And I got on stage and I spoke openly um, for the first time ever in life about March 11, 2005 and the things that led me up to that day. And I've never talked in my life. Uh, this is my second conversation talking about me outside of, you know, the conversation I had on, you know, on the bridge with Briggs. Um, and, you know, just the, after I came off the stage, I remember, you know, the people stood up, standing ovation. It was, that was, you know, I'm talking about the worst day of my life here. And it, it just, and I remember coming down and it was a lady, um, it was a mother and she said, you know, I, you know, now this happens all the time. People come down and, you know, people talk to me. So I'm kind of used to it now. But this was the very first time she said, my son, Jacob, lost his battle five years ago and I haven't slept. And I'm going to sleep tonight because I can better under because you told your story. She said, I'm, I can better understand what Jacob was going through now. Wow. And in that moment, in that moment right there is when everything and something, something in my something switched, like something changed in me right there in that moment. And I knew that I didn't want to go back to California and be the same person anymore. Like I knew that I, that I, I found a purpose. I found, I found, I found my reason. I found my why. And see, the thing is people just need to find their why. I found my why in that moment. And I came back to California and I remember I flew back. It was, you know, like May 8th of 2013. And it took me a couple of weeks to kind of get it together. But May 21st, 2013 is when everything in my life changed. It was the first day I woke up and I didn't want to die. Oh, that is amazing. And, amazing. you know, that was May 21st, 2013. Again, you were able to speak. You were able to talk. I was able to be heard. So important to, to be heard and to have people willing to listen. And then what you were saying was impacting others. You were giving others peace. Yeah. Uh, and understanding as well. Kevin Briggs, tell us about your perspective of what it was like to meet Kevin Berthia again for the first time in eight years since you were on the bridge together. Um, I didn't know what to expect. Mm. You know, I was hoping that, that it, it would go as well as it did. So um, I wanted to tell you though, first off, I did not want to be there. <laughs> they, they really had to push me to be there because mm -hmm. I'm accepting award, but there's others working on that bridge with the highway patrol that do this same kind of work. So I, you know, I told them, all right, I will go out there and I will accept this award, but I'm accepting it on behalf of the California highway patrol Marina area, because it, it just seemed very egotistical. Why is all this attention coming on me? Mm -hmm. And there were some people who were jaded about that in my office and, and bitter about it, but the whole nother story. Um, it was really, really cool to connect that night. I had no idea Kev, hated that photo so much so found that out you know that was interesting um and this was filled with a lot of high-end folks in this in this place the lincoln center in new york city and it was really really cool it's a black tie event so we got our pictures together i brought out a very close friend of mine and it was neat to see what transpired that evening um, before we were just at all these tables and kev was sitting at my table and we were just hanging out. But after we went up on stage, it was amazing how many people after that came up and wanted to talk. You know, we were just attendees and all of a sudden, boom, they saw the picture and what had transpired. So it turned a lot of people uh, in, in their, their look and how they perceived us. So it was very interesting. 
And of course, now we know Kev hated that picture, but he found out he could do something good with it. And now we have the opportunity individually and together to go out and spread the word and talk about that day and how we can help folks. And so many people need help. So many people need help. Yes. Kevin, you retired from the California Highway Patrol a number of years ago, correct? Yes. Um, the end of 2013. All right. That same year then. So Kevin Berthia, how did meeting Officer Briggs that day on the bridge uh, impact the person you are today? And what does your friendship with Kevin mean to you? Um, well, without that interaction, I'm not here to have this conversation. And I'm clear about that. I'm, I'm very adamant of knowing that this, this was not a, a script. <laughs> you know, I, it, it was really over that day and it was supposed to be over. So um, knowing that, um, I'm very grateful for um, the encounter, not only the encounter, but, but the friendship um, to know that my idea of, of law enforcement is changed because of him. Um, I, I grew up in Oakland, California, where my perception of law enforcement was going to be different from somebody else that grew up somewhere else because I never had a great encounter with what we call a cops, like, you know, cops. Cop. And now I can call them law enforcement because of him, because I got the opportunity to realize that they just are people because he showed me he was, I would have never believed in a million years that I was talking to a cop on March 11, 2005. If you would have played back the time, I still wouldn't have believed it because I never would have had a conversation with a cop. I had a conversation with a human. So to know that our relationship supersedes all expectation of what society says and that two people from two opposite worlds can have this conversation and this conversation can lead to one, you know, the one, a great friendship. Like this is, you know, we genuinely enjoy each other's space. It's not something we have to like put on for the world. Like we can care less with the world that like, you know, we genuinely just, I genuinely like being around him. I genuinely like hearing him speak. When we go speak together, I genuinely like sitting in the audience and listen to what he has to say. Um, he's, you know, he's, you know, an incredible human being. And I enjoy, um, I, I'm glad it was him and I know it had to be him. So I am very grateful for the encounter and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be his friend. Thank you very much for that, uh, Kevin. Kevin Briggs, what is your friendship with Kevin Berthia mean to you? Well, it means the world to me. Yeah, you know, I had no intention of, of ever meeting him again after that day. I don't want to be a trigger for anything for him. I, you know, wished him the very best. And then to meet him out uh, for the AFSP gala and then to come around full circle and I'll be speaking with him. I mean, who would ever think that it, the odds of us getting together years later and then speaking together and traveling together, astronomical. So and it's not just that we chat, you know, we'll chat once a month, whether it's a text checking on each other or, or whatever may be going on. So um, it has crossed so many barriers uh, and it's, and I like looking at it because I like to see how he has progressed and he's doing so well. So, and then he checks on me because he knows I, I have a, a ton of issues. So uh, it's, you know, it, it goes back and forth and it's really, really cool. You know, I had pre-calls with both of you and spent quite a bit of time talking with you both. I think we were, we were on the phone on Zoom forever. I was on with both of you forever. My wife, Kelly's downstairs. She says, you still on the phone up there? <laughs> I said, these guys are wonderful. And one of the things I, I noticed, first of all, you both listen very well. One of the things I noticed is the friendship that you have and how fondly you spoke about each other. And Kevin Berthy, I remember, I forgot I said something about, uh, about Kevin Briggs. And you're like, oh, I'll, I'll text him now, you said. So it's like, these guys are close friends. This is so wonderful. It's very moving for me because we've had some experiences with, um, with depression and anxiety in our family. And I do myself struggle with anxiety a lot. And it, it, can, it can take up a lot of space in your life. And to be able to just talk and have somebody listen who understands it is it's just priceless it's just priceless and the work you guys do together is amazing and i'm just honored to know both of you but 
I'm going to ask you, Kevin Briggs, also was, I think you partially answered this, is how has meeting Kevin Berthy on the bridge that day impacted the person you are today? Well, I retired from the highway patrol to do this speaking as I do, and, and I retired at age 50, which is pretty unusual. Um, so it has impacted me you know, greatly and allowed me to come out in something that I would have never thought me, a, a public speaker. Uh, I would never have done this, but it, I think it's helped me grown um, a lot, to say the least, you know, to, to push myself. It's a lot of work. And I thought, boy, if I'm going to start my own business uh, for this, I may be working at a coffee shop in a couple of weeks. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but here I am trying to to get all these different things done. And, and now we're looking at a movie. Um, you know, if we can present together, then that's that's what we want is our instead of doing things separate so it's a joy because we cross so many barriers so many bases um i retired early to do this type of stuff based on that event given a number of opportunities you know there's a book out now and i'm working some with some mental health professionals on a couple of workbook these things would have never transpired and i had a great time on the harbor patrol but i had a number of events and different things come my way so I took those opportunities and, and that's, I think we both, Kev and I talk about that, taking those opportunities. They're scary. You don't know where they're going to lead, but work hard. Boy, take those opportunities because they don't come along very often. Yeah, definitely. Now I want to ask you this question. I'm going to go to Kevin Berthia on this one for starters, and then I'll circle back uh, with you, Kevin. Nobody saw this pandemic coming. How do you think the pandemic is affecting people today and has affected them, even as we're coming out of the other side of it? And how does that make you feel with regard to the work that you do and the passion that you have for helping people? The pandemic, um, I, could, I, I could speak for myself first and foremost. So I'm not speaking from an area of like, you know, assuming, and I always put myself in it to know that, I know how I rock me. Um, I know me and me and Briggs on March 10th of 2020, we were at an event together, you know, and we were joking, people were joking and we were like, you know, giving fist bumps and like, let's not hug. And then two days later, the world shut down and everything that, that I had planned, everything that was our last event. Like for, I went, you know, two years without an event. You know, almost two years without a, a live event, everything went online. So they just completely changed. And I think the pandemic changed. And that's what we are. We are routine people. We get up and we do the same thing every day, whether it be on Monday, we do the same thing on that Monday too. So knowing that we can't do our routines, that's what ch has changed the whole mindset of, of where humanity is. And that's why mental health has been pushed to the forefront because, people, you know, now we are talking about it because we, you know, we have to talk about it because everybody was greatly affected by it. And for me being this, you know, compassionate person, I, I want to do so much more than what I'm doing um, because I see where the world is because of this pandemic. I saw the war the world was before the pandemic. And now we're we're in a bad place, you know, mentally, because you know, we know we're we're in a bad place, but we still don't want to identify it because we still are trying to figure out how not to deal with it. And it's just like, no, let's deal with it. We got the opportunity to create the space to deal with these things and, and move forward and heal from them instead of pushing them to the left and acting like they don't exist. So um, you know, just trying to get the word out there more. The more and more we tell the story, somebody in the audience gets something out of it. They take it to somebody like we change humanity. Somebody's going to hear this. They're going to, you know, just wrote a suicide note last night and they're going to change their mind. That's just the reality of how powerful these talks are. And that's why we have to continue to, you know, have these talks. Thank you, Kevin. I'm going to go to Kevin Briggs now. Uh, what are your thoughts about the pandemic and how it has affected really the work that you're doing and the society at large? Well, it, I think it was fantastic for Zoom and, and things like this, but, you know, People, as a society, we want to be around other people. Well, we like our private times too, but it, it took away so much stuff. I'm, and I work at, when I'm not traveling, I work at my local schools, 13 different schools. And I definitely see it with the kids. They were locked up so long in their homes. You know, the, the grades are different than they were. 
Now when they're out and they're playing with each other, it's even quite different because there's so much energy and they all want to have attention that they go overboard with what they're trying to do. And just with us, when I would go on the freeway, there would be no kind of cars compared to what typically it was. It would be stop and go traffic. California has a ton of traffic. But you know, at least we were able to do something like this. Now, it's not direct connection. You're not right there with that individual. But you know these kind of things helped a lot. But we definitely saw uh, a lot of mental health issues and people talking about that. You know, if you're locked inside this place, it's it's just not good. And those of us with anxiety, um, I can go three days and not go out of the house. But then I, I force myself to, whether that's taking the dogs for a walk or I go out and I have coffee four or five times a week uh, with some folks. And that forces me to get out of this house. And that really helps to get out in the sunshine, to get out and have this communication with people. So without that, you know, our mental health declines. So it's going to be a while before we recover, but I think it is getting better. You're right on that, Kevin. Thank you. So I've been talking about the work that the two of you do, both individually and together. But Kevin Berthia, I want to go to you. Tell us about the work you're doing through the Kevin Berthia Foundation. I got the opportunity uh, over the last five, six years to travel and speak and tell this story. And in that here hear other people's story and learn about where the vulnerabilities are inside our healthcare system and inside of where our, where's the connection being lost? Like, why are we losing so many people? Like, why are the numbers, um, you know, astronomical like they are? Why are we not talking about this more? So I realized that what I'm looking for in society doesn't exist and I, I need to create it. So that's where the idea of the Kevin Berthia Foundation um, became and I only I use my name because I've always spent my whole life trying not to be me and so it, it's a reminder to just be yourself it's just to, to accept who you are um, it's, it's for, for those people who suffer in silence um, you know we it's so many of us that that really have undiagnosed mental health conditions that we don't want to reach out for help because we're, we're afraid of how people will look at us not knowing that the people that are looking at us have their own undiagnosed mental health conditions so it's just it's the idea of, of spreading the awareness about my story and making people see that, you know, it doesn't define who you are. And uh, the foundation is just, it's gonna, you know, starts off small and eventually I hope to have buildings with lighthouse and where people can come for a safe refuge and, and have the ability to talk and have open conversations about who they are and, you know, have clinicians and therapists and a couple, you know, psychiatrists who might come on board. I mean, it's just, it's, it started off a dream and then I just got it into, into action and it just came, you know, something small and now it's just turning into, it's turning into something and I'm watching it, you know, take off and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to just help people. Oh, that's terrific. Now, Kevin, how can people find out more about Kevin Berthia Foundation? Uh, my website, uh, www.kevinberthiafoundation.org. Um, everything is pretty much on there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm available everywhere, uh, all social media platforms. Like my name, Kevin Berthia, because like I say, I, I have to be okay with being who I am. So everything is Kevin Berthia, so I could be found everywhere. Um, and I always tell people it's not about me, it's about the message. Oh, that's terrific. And I've seen your website, and it's a good one. It's a really good one. Uh, Appreciate that. Sure. Kevin Briggs. So tell us about the work that you're doing through your organization, Pivotal Points. Yes. So pretty much along the same lines as Kevin Berthia, going out and doing presentations. And like I said, uh, when we get to get the chance to speak together, then it's, it's just a lot more effective. I really enjoy it. So I do that. I work at the local schools, my local schools, mentoring you know, a number of projects. I'm working with a couple of mental health professionals to do specific workbooks, for instance, corrections and construction workers and things like that. And then we'll do presentations on that. Some folks are looking at us, Kevin and I, for a, for a movie. So that's in the works. Mm. So we have a, a number of things going on. But yes, the you know, I enjoy going out and doing presentations. It pushes me to a different level. They say, you know, push yourself in these uncomfortable situations to grow. It really does. As I tell folks, when I'm on stage, I'm about 15 feet tall because it's uncomfortable, but I believe in it. So whether that's <laughs> speaking like in June, I'll be, I, I'm lucky enough to go out to the FBI Academy and, and do a class out there. 
that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, community groups. We both love doing community groups. They're one of our favorites, you know, whether that's law enforcement agencies of how to talk to folks, teaching negotiations, or one-on-one, uh, a parent talking to their kid. What are they looking for? And then how do they talk to their child? So whatever it is, um, we've done a lot of work into this and and we're there for the people. So our main thing is coming out and and talking to folks. I know you're both reaching a lot of people, I'm sure. And at this particular time, I, I mean, it's, uh, I, I hear about people, you know, rage issues on airplanes and, you know, you can see it in, you know, uh, public places. Sometimes people are kind of at their last nerve in some cases. So mental health is so important. It is so important. But I like the Kevin Briggs, I liked it when you said about forcing yourself to get out into the sunshine. It really does help. And I know uh, Kevin Berthy would agree that sometimes you just got to move yourself. Your legs have to move yourself out and start doing something, get some fresh air. You know what I love? I don't know. I don't know how it does it, but you know, I live in New Jersey. So we have the, uh, we call it the shore in New Jersey. And being down, walking on the boardwalk and hearing those waves crash, <laughs> there's something about that that it, it's just, it's beautiful. But there's so many other opportunities. Go for a walk or a jog or something just to get out and get fresher. We just got, even if we don't want to, even if we'd rather sit and worry about something, you know, got to get outside. But uh, Kevin Briggs, you also have written a book called The Guardian of the Golden Gate, Protecting the Line Between Hope and Despair. Can you tell us a little bit about that book and maybe how people might be able to get it? Sure. They can look at Amazon or have their local bookstore order it. Um, it's about my life and and a lot of things that have happened with it. And then a number of folks, Kev wrote um, a chapter in there, a number of folks that I had dealt with. And it's about, you know, how folks can help themselves and how they can help others. And a lot of it about me and the things I've been through. So I tell folks what they don't see is they see a man in crisis over that rail with Kevin Berthea, but there's another side to that. So when I was 20 years old, I had testicular cancer, been diagnosed with PTSD from some severe abuse when I was very, very young, uh, three stents in my heart, you know, uh, just a whole gamut of different things. And we're still going through different therapies. I recently went through stellate ganglion blockers injections in the neck to help block the images at night. So there's a lot of stuff that, that's been going on um, that I like to touch base with this book in the hopes that it will be entertaining you know, as a good read, but also help people. And that's kind of like our talks. I want them to be entertaining, but also I want folks to be able to take things away that they can use in their everyday life. That's my hope on that. Yeah. Thank you. When you said entertaining, I mean, in effect, stories are the best way to get information out. They're the most, they make the most memorable vehicles for getting information out. And we do this podcast, your history, your story, because everybody has a story to tell. But if you remember from school, it's usually those teachers who told stories about a subject that made us remember them. And the work that the two of you do by telling your stories, uh, I think that it, it likely really gets the word out in a very effective way and helps people to reach out to others. Like uh, Kevin Berthia, you talked about having somebody listen and just being able to talk. And all of a sudden, you know, you're okay with saying, I'm, I'm Kevin Berthia, and this is my story. Now you're, you're that person, you're Kevin Berthia, and you got a story. And that story is helping others. And Kevin Briggs, same thing. You know, as you said in your book, you got a lot of stuff that happened to you and you're on the other side of that railing, but you've got a story to tell as well. And I think when you've undergone these experiences, it's probably, it just leads to an authenticity to your, to your audience that, Hey, these people have been through these things and I can listen and I can glean some very important things from these guys. That's so, what we're hoping for. We really are, you know, to get up there to share real true life examples, but then how are we now? You can get past this. You may still have some dark times, but we can get past this and, and then help other people. Definitely. Now you both, I'm going to go back to Kevin Berthia for a second. You've, 
You've got potentially a, a movie coming up. Are there any other plans that the two of you have for any uh, in-person speaking engagements? Uh, we have something coming. Up. Yeah, we have something coming up in June. Um, and then I have, you know, a couple of things in September that I'm working out. Um, the things are kind of still trying to just, you know, fragile, you know, as they open it up, you know, are we going we go open up or are we go. So it's just I think that, you know, once we get to a framework that people will be more comfortable, I think that a lot more. I think I'm 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 more excited about next year because I think that next year is going to be a good a good solid year for um for us together and hopefully we can go on tour. Like oh, I would have always want I want us to go on tour, and that's what I that's what I want that's what I'm trying to work on. Like you know how the you know the, the musicians they they go to they three shows in this state three shows in it like you know I we need to go on tour we need to spread this message and get it out there and I think that you know time will reveal that time and and uh, I'm excited about the future. And I know. Uh... Kevin Berthy, you had mentioned to me in our call last time that your faith is very important to you and has energized you in so many ways. Can you say a few things about that, Kevin? Absolutely. Um, I was I was raised in a church and kind of got away from it. Uh, my mom raised me to be this God fearing faith man, and and I kind of got away from it. And that's where you know would expose me to the world. And now I'm getting back to just inside of understanding that you know the world you know, he is my world. Like, you know, and I, you know, I'm a servant and I'm, I'm out here just trying to do my part and I can't, you know, you know, get wrapped up in these worldly issues, like, you know, and, and have it always be about bills, have it always be about money and rent and all that. Like, it's gotta be about more things than that. I mean, because that stuff always going to be due. It, it's going to always going to be like, I need to, you know, I had to focus on, um, you know, just the ability that I'm up in order to face the, have these issues. Like, you know, I, I'm alive in order to have my problems, you know? And so uh, my faith is extremely important to me and it's what gets me through every single day. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, Kevin Briggs, some final thoughts that you might have for people that are listeners and particularly people who might be struggling with some mental health issues. What would you say to some of those people right now? Well, tell them, find what works for you. Don't be afraid to seek help. And sometimes it's very, very hard you know, it may take a couple of months before you might be able to see a mental health professional. I mean, that's just the way things are right now. There is teletherapy where we can do like a Zoom call, but don't be afraid to reach out and seek help and get the help that you feel is right. Get a mental health professional that you click with, so to speak. You want know, to find what works for you. Write down some coping mechanisms that work for you. Um, and there is, there's a lot of help out there. Be careful of who you're you're talking to surround yourself with some positive people get outside hit a coffee shop or something or do a walk you know it's it can be very brutal staying inside all the time mm. so force yourself to get out and you know i think that really helps is that first step of getting outside for folks and it's also that first step of taking action all right i'm tired of feeling this way what can i do so find what works best for you and even write those down and say, all right, when I'm not feeling right, here's the things that I can do, my coping mechanisms. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Kevin Berthia, has some final thoughts for somebody who might be listening and feel down, depressed, anxious. You got to, uh, first and foremost, you got to accept where you're at and, and be okay with that place and know that that's not your, your, your final destination. You know, so many times we 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 are so afraid to accept who we are, who we and we end up staying there. <laughs> we stay in that dark place because we don't accept that we're there. And the first thing you have to do is accept that you're in that dark place because there is help. There is so much help um, in this world for us that we, but we don't accept it. We're, the place that we're in, so we miss the help. And the helpers don't know how to. It's a two part thing, you know. People that are helping have to have to be willing to know how to help and people that are that need the help have to be willing to reach out, you know, and be OK with getting help. I mean, it's just it has to be on both ends. We can't, you know, have an assumption that this person she needs to do this and then this person needs to do this. So if you're in that dark place, just know you're not alone for one. And uh, for two, and like I tell people, and I've been pushing this hard. You deserve to see it get better. 
Like, you know, you do, um, you deserve to see it get better. You, you know, too many times we get into that dark place and we don't, we, we think that this is our life. Oh, this is how my life is going to be. No, you deserve to see it get better. You deserve to, you know, get on the other side of it and really just see, you know, why all this is happening. And it does get better. Like, I promise you that it really does. Like, you know, but you, you got to believe it. You got to really make certain changes and, and, and you can do it. Like, and I only say that is because I never in a million years thought my life would be where it is. Um, is it perfect? No. So I struggle every day still, you know, absolutely. But I, I learned how to struggle and I learned that it doesn't define me and it neither does, and it doesn't define you. Thank you, Kevin. And, and again, I would thank both you gentlemen. You're very inspirational people. You've inspired me. I'm sure you'll inspire our listeners. And I really wish you both the very, I pray for the best for both of you because the work you're doing is critical. It, I mean, the type of work you do is, has always been critical, but particularly now when mental health, you know, is really being strained uh, by the circumstances in this world. I just wish you both the very, very best. And I'm so glad you guys are friends because, you know, you take the individual work you're doing, but when you guys, when you guys are working together, you're like supersonic. <laughs> I can sense it coming out of the, it's coming out of the computer right now. You guys are supersonic. So I'm going to be following both of you. I wish we lived closer. I'd love to have a cup of coffee with both of you, but Hey, maybe we can have a zoom coffee sometime. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> okay, guys. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, James. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of your history, your story. You can connect with us on Facebook and YouTube at Your History, Your Story, or on Instagram and Twitter at YHYS Podcast. We'd love to hear from you if you have any questions, comments, or a story to tell. Be well and God bless.